not talking anything related to that. Um, so um, today we're going to continue on in the book of First Timothy. Um, we're going to be getting into chapter two. Um, we kind of established at the beginning this book is a uh, book written by Paul to his disciple Timothy. Um, as the age of the apostles is coming to an end, the apostles um, at this point, half of them are gone and uh, even the ones that are left are getting old and up there. So uh, Paul wants to lay down some uh, principles to help the church continue on once uh, that time is over. Um, so last time we talked about testimony, the wonderful story each one of us has about uh, how Jesus Christ came into the world to save the worst of sinners ourselves and uh, just the grace he poured out on us and uh, the praise we owe him for that. And, you know, it's got us all worked up and excited, you know, at this point, okay, let's, you know, lay down a good doctrinal statement, uh, you know, or well, let's get out and start preaching. But uh, that's not where Paul goes with this. He says, okay, now it's time to pray, which, you know, kind of to me, it's like a full stop. Um, this uh, sermon is kind of a self indictment uh, I know I've been very bad at prayer over the years. We kind of laughed at it about <laughs> laughed about it at my elders meeting last month. That uh, you know every year when it comes to what do I need to work on, it's always prayer. So, in continuation with God's sense of humor, um, we're going to be talking about that this morning. And like I said, a lot of this stuff is preaching directly to myself. Um, prayer doesn't tend to be the first thing we go to, but, uh, you know, when you start building the church, you know, the logical starting point is to, you know, ask the foreman what you're building. You know, are you building a cabin? Are you building a mansion? You know, going to them and getting the detailed plan of what you're doing seems like the appropriate response. And also we as Christians tend to, uh, market ourselves as not a religion, but a relationship. Well, if you're going to claim relationship over religion, your first step should be communication, you know, with the one that you're claiming to have the relationship with. So that's where we're going to start this morning. I'm going to read our passage, and then I'm going to dive right in. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So let's uh, open up in prayer. Lord, we pray that you'll bless this time. Give me the words to say and uh, give those in the audience the, the ears to hear and to understand. And um, let us all get what you intend out of this passage, uh, and let us come out of it glorifying you and uh, just wanting to pursue obedience, Lord, the obedience to go and pray for all peoples, and uh, we do this in your holy name, amen. So starting uh, right away in the first verse, I urge you then, first of all, We'll kind of stop there for a minute because, uh, like I mentioned before, first of all, prayer is not, does not tend to be our first response to anything. If, uh, once again, you're anything like me, you start with panicking, trying to fix the problem, worrying about the problem, stressing out a little more, trying again to fix the problem, and then sometime in that, like, two minutes at the very end, you quick offer up a, God, please help me, and... You know, that's pretty much the extent of it. Uh, you know, as one uh, hymn we sing uh, says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And uh, James puts it, uh, You desire 
but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, and you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And that's James 4, 2, and 3. So prayer tends to be the after effect, that sometimes even after we engage in sin to try to fix our problems. But uh, we need to train ourselves. We need to get ourselves to the point where we go from that uh, James 4 mentality to actually the James 5 mentality, um, 13 through 16. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If you have sinned, they will be forgiven. So we kind of need to get in that mentality. You know, is it sunny out? Pray. Is it, you know, rainy out? Pray. You know, did you wake up at 5 a.m. accidentally? Pray. You know, pray becomes the natural response to everything, but it's not a natural response. So we need to discipline ourselves to get into that mentality that our first response to everything is to pray. Going along in our uh, verse here, um, when uh, Paul references that uh, all these prayers should be made for all people, he's not talking about every single person on the face of the earth. We'd never uh, get out of our prayer closets if we prayed for every single person on the face of the earth. But uh, what he means is all kinds of people, all different kinds of people we may come in contact with. We tend to stick with our safer groups, you know, our friends, our family, people who are sick, and, you know, sometimes ourselves. And by all means, don't stop praying for those people. Paul wants you to pray for them, too. If anybody's praying for me, please do not stop. <laughs> I beg of you. This sermon will be a whole lot worse for you <laughs> if you stop praying for me. But uh, at the same time, he's calling us to pray for the cashier at Quick Trip who checks us out or you know, one of our co-workers that's having issues that uh, we haven't really spent the time print, uh, investing in. But, uh, and also in uh, Luke uh, 6, 27 through 28, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So even those in our lives that are making our lives harder, uh, who are against us, who seem to be at our throats at every turn. We're supposed to be praying for them. And uh, we see how hard that is as this uh, um, verse kind of plays out. So Paul breaks down four, prayer into four separate categories. Um, the one that seems to be missing would be uh, just plain praising God. But uh, that might be because he covered it in fairly great detail in chapter one, that we should come into this with that mentality that we've been saved at the wor as the worst of sinners, and we should already be singing his praise by the time we get to this point when we're praying for all people. <clears throat> the uh, first type of prayer he mentions here is pe uh, petitions, or some uh, versions say supplications. This is, um, to put it simply, it's asking God to meet a need. It's give us a, this day our daily bread, or um, uh, once again in James 5, when it mentions Elijah, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. So it's asking God to meet usually a physical need, um, that uh, we or somebody has. And uh, obviously this uh, pales in comparison to the spiritual needs that uh, people have. We should always be prioritizing them. But uh, at the same time, sometimes those physical needs need to be met before someone is willing to listen to you. And uh, we see Jesus constantly healing the sick and feeding the 5,000 and meeting the physical needs before he goes into the spiritual analogy behind them. So uh, we should be praying to 
<clears throat> meet the physical needs of people. The uh, second word prayer means prayer. <laughs> You know, sometimes words just mean what they mean. But uh, this uh, John MacArthur points out that Paul may have chosen this specific word for prayer um, in here because this is one word that is specifically only used to address God. You can have intercessions, supplications. You can be thankful to people. You can uh, give... Uh, supplications to a king you can be thankful to your mother um but uh the word prayer specifically reminds you that you are approaching a deity a deity that is holy um a deity that is above us and there's a certain level of respect and fear as you come into the presence of god that you don't have when you're um approaching a king or your mother or anyone else there's um, certainly a level above that that needs to be addressed. The uh, third intercession is uh, probably the one we're uh, most familiar with when we're praying for other people. It has kind of a courtroom feel to it. Uh, it's advocating or speaking on behalf of a person. So um, it kind of implies also that you have a level of empathy and compassion for that person. Um, when Jesus died, he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was him interceding for the people there. Um, and uh, according to Hebrews 7, 24 through 26, uh, he's still doing that today um, in God's presence for each of us. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who have come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them such a high priest meets our needs one who is holy blameless pure set apart from sinners exalted above the heavens and as this one you know deals with salvation it's uh obviously the most important or one of the most important and uh we need to be praying for all those people sometimes it's not fun to pray for those people sometimes you know we if we especially if we don't like a person we don't want to stand before god in compassion and you know make a case for them it's you know it frustrates us think of jonah who was called to preach the word to the ninevites and in the end he just turned on god and said i knew you were too merciful <laughs> i knew you would forgive them but uh we need to continue to pray for our enemies and hopefully develop a better attitude as a result of it. Um, the fourth one, Thanksgiving, is pretty straightforward to be thankful for all people. Um, I don't think a lot of times we're nearly as thankful for the people in our lives that God has provided for us as we should be. God has provided us with uh, parents, God has provided us with uh, a church family. God has provided, you know, sometimes the co-workers, the cashiers, all the people that make up our daily life and uh, we don't pay enough attention to, but uh, we should be thanking God for them and making that conscious effort. And uh, even our enemies, you know, um, through suffering produces perseverance and God can use them much like uh, God used Joseph's brothers. You know, they, um, God isn't calling us to be thankful to these people for what they've done or thankful, you know, for their sinful behavior. God mourns over their sinful behavior a whole lot more than any of us do. But uh, God uh, wants us to um, realize that, um, like in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done now, the saving of many lives. So God can use even the enemies we have to um, accomplish his goals. And we should be thankful for all those people God puts in our lives. Um, the wording implies here that this isn't a one-time event either, that we uh, would continue to 
pray for all these others, pray for the different groups of people in our lives continually as we go through our lives. Um, much like uh, Jesus gave the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow, we are to continue to approach and continue and continue um, even when it doesn't seem like we're getting through. That seems like a really odd concept because there's no other thing in life I feel like I can apply that to. That parable always hits me because, you know, persistence with a real judge probably wouldn't end this well. You'd probably end up getting yourself in jail, but God calls us to persist with him in prayer. So... <clears throat> All right, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So God is calling specifically for the, us to pray for the authorities in our lives. This, uh, he specifically mentions governmental authorities, but it can also be, you know, parents and children and husbands and wives and bosses and employees. Uh, he mentions this probably for you know a couple different reasons one's pragmatic if we pray for you know our leaders to make good decisions then they can make those good decisions and we can live in peace with them and uh you know everything can go well for everybody the other reason i noticed you know several commentators and even reading it myself is you know they wanted them to pray for the king because unless you told them to, you weren't going to find people willing to pray, <laughs> pray for these people. Um, a lot of the, you know, as bad as we think things are here, it's like government's always been full of tyrants and people who manipulate the system. And uh, this was no different. The Jews resented the Romans who were put over them. Uh, a lot of the other conquered people did as well. If we look at some of the government authorities even in the new testament the jewish sanhedrin uh, ruled you know they uh um condemned jesus to die they constantly had the disciples beaten all for their own self-righteousness that they uh um didn't want exposed uh pontius pilate had the ability to free jesus but uh was too much of a coward to take it up so he just let it go. Um, Felix, the governor who imprisoned Paul, you know, believed Paul was innocent, but was kind of hoping that he was going to slip him a bribe to get out. So he was uh, looking for a little extra money. And uh, you could do an entire sermon on the different Herods and all the things they did to the people of the faith. Uh, and, you know, the crowning thing of it all, of course, was the Roman emperor at the time, Nero, a name associated primarily with the persecution of Christians and one of the worst persecutors of the, you know, church that, I mean, even up until today. Uh, so Paul here is calling us to pray for that guy. And, you know, who is, without specifically being told, who's going to intercede for that guy? <laughs> you know, who's going to throw out their compassion and say, you know, you know who really would be great to, if you showed some compassion to, Lord, the Emperor Nero. You know, it all comes back to that mentality we learned last time, the trustworthy saying that um, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I'm the worst. That mentality that, you know, Jesus Christ has already saved the worst of sinners, and therefore he wants me, as the former worst of sinners, to take that message to all the other worst of sinners out there, that his grace uh, can cover anything, his Love can defeat anything. Oh, <laughs> make a mess of myself. <clears throat> the rest of that verse, uh, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Those uh, peaceful and quiet, uh, the Greek words there have uh, two kind of opposite meanings. One means peace without. Kind of like that, uh, we talked about that, uh, you know, if we pray for these people, they'll make good laws, you know, they'll allow us to live in peace. But uh, the second one is that uh, peace within, that uh, God will bring peace to us. And, you know, we can adopt that uh, Jonah mentality that it's like, well, I'm going to pray for him, but I'm not going to like it. But, uh, you know, 
sometimes we get so caught up in the, uh, you know, thinking the purpose of prayer is to get God to um, take our side and things, but um, really the purpose of prayer is to conform ourselves to God through that process. Uh, good example of this, if not the best in scripture, is uh, Jesus praying to God in the go garden in Luke 22. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So ultimately, Jesus is saying, you know, here's a prayer request, but conform me to your will. Help me to understand your will. Help me to um, be transformed in a way that I accept your will. Um, the more we converse with God and start seeing his, things his way, the more we'll be at peace about everything that we go through. <clears throat> Which flows, you know, right into our next verse there. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants, pe <coughs> who wants people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So we always talk about, you know, what can I do to please God, you know, the answer is right there. You can pray for all of his people. You can show love and compassion the same as he does um, to the people around you. And uh, not only to um, save them, but that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. And there's a lot of lies out there. Um, and uh, Paul here is going to... <clears throat> lay down some hard truths right here. Um, some things that we sometimes keep, take for granted, but also tie in with prayer is, uh, first of all, there is one God. Um, this seems like kind of a well-does statement in you know, today's world. I mean, even, even if there are multiple ways to God, there can't be all the gods at once. That doesn't make any sense. Not everybody can be right, but that's kind of taken for granted in the uh, culture Paul and uh, Timothy lived in. Well, you know, it's uh, the Jews were monotheists and the, you know, newly founded Christian religion was monotheist. But, uh, you know, it was kind of generally believed that, well, yeah, he, he's the God, Yahweh is the God of the Jews, but I, I got my Roman gods over here too. The Greeks got their gods and, you know, the um, Ninevites had their gods and, so on and so forth, you know, if even if it wasn't blasphemous, it was at least rude <laughs> to suggest that your God is the only God out there. So Paul is saying here that there is only one God. So once again, going back to our topic of prayer, if you're praying to the wrong God, what good does that do you? Uh, not a whole lot of good. Um, or a lot of uh, people also started to engage in what was called henotheism, which also means one God, but it means a focus on one God. So they might say, you know, the God of the Bible is the one God, but there's all these other gods too. They're like minor deities. They're not as important. Uh, and that came into um, the church as a problem because people started saying that Jesus was one of those minor deities, that the God of the Bible used the demigod Jesus over here to do his bidding and to, you know, work in a world he was not really focused on himself. So um, we need to come to a knowledge that there is only one God and only he can be prayed to. The uh, second part uh, tends to be more of an issue in today's culture that there is only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. It's you know, it might not be hard to believe for people that there is one God, but saying that there is only one way to that God, well, you know, all religions lead to that God, you know. Why would I need to go through Jesus? But, uh, <clears throat> uh, and it was kind of a, even in Paul's time, it was kind of an odd idea. Even Judaism had the priesthood you know, that step between God and man. The temples had their priests and their priestesses. Um, even today, you see uh, some things like Catholics have their priests and Greek Orthodox have their 
icons and even within uh you know protestant circles people are tempted to believe that you know a pastor or an elder might uh be a little bit holier and you know might be more apt to handle that prayer thing than anybody else um i know uh and it's not just people either some use you know crucifixes think you know that type of thing gets them closer to god uh johnny had mentioned saint peter's basilica a few weeks back people go places they think bring them closer to god but uh according to this verse and really the entire bible jesus christ is the only thing that brings us closer to god there um, as was mentioned earlier it's a narrow way and there's only one narrow way and that's the person of jesus christ and uh he goes on to tell us why <clears throat> who gave himself as a ransom for all people this was witnessed at the proper time so jesus paid for us jesus through his blood, First um, Peter 1, 18 through 19, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as gold or silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So he has earned his right to become the only mediator between God and man. <clears throat> And now through that one meteor, we can approach God with the assistance of the one spirit interceding for us, uh, Romans 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, the spirit intercedes for us in our weakness. We do not know how we ought to pray, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So in a very real sense, because God is the one we're praying to, Christ is the mediator, and the Spirit uh, helps us through that process, we're really entering a, into a conversation of, with the Trinity, you know, taking part in that Trinitarian relationship that has existed since the dawn of time. And, you know, really we should be in awe of that, but um, we tend to, once again, like I said, off-put prayer and it tends to be at the bottom of our list and um unfortunately our uh, last verse here kind of uh goes along with that idea and for this purpose i was appointed a herald and an apostle i am telling the truth and not i am not lying and a true and faithful teacher to the gentiles so for whatever reason here it seems like paul's jumping in and saying you know, trust me, I'm not lying. He's asserting his authority. He's giving you the titles as apostle to the Gentiles. And he's like, no, I really need you to believe this, which, you know, leads you to believe that, you know, people might have been questioning this line of uh, thinking. Paul actually uh, uses his phrase two other times in scripture. One is in Romans 9, when he's trying to convince the people of Israel that if it were up to him, he would be cut off from Christ if it would save them. So if he was able to trade his own salvation for that of Israel, he would be willing to do it. And he was basically says, no, believe me, I'm not lying. So, you know, kind of a extreme statement in that one. And the second one is in Second uh, Corinthians 11, when he starts boasting about his suffering, he goes through all the list of all the suffering he has endured and says, you know, I'm happy that I was able to suffer for Christ, you know, and says, I am not lying because, you know, with a response like that, people might think he's nuts. <laughs> Rejoicing and suffering, that's a really out there idea. But uh, no, no, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. So when Paul says here that he's telling the truth and not lying, it makes you think that people are probably questioning a lot of the stuff he's just gone over. And, uh, you know, I really think of our culture and uh, you go out and say that you're praying nowadays and you get scoffed at, you get yelled at. And, you know, to the culture, they say prayer is the equivalent to doing nothing. You know, prayer is uh, a waste of time. And, you know, in some, actually in some countries, it's a threat against, you know, protected minorities. Yeah, they don't want you praying anywhere near an abortion clinic or 
you know, one of their LGBT events, you know, you're, you're a threat, you're an offense. Um, but, uh, and, you know, add on the fact that you've got your one God, one way thing. And yeah, all of a sudden, nobody's believing you. But, uh, you know, Paul insists here, I'm making sure, you know, he is not lying. He's telling the truth. This is his gospel. This is why he was called to preach to the the Gentiles is because he believes in a God, a mediator, Jesus Christ, and the power of that God to get things done in the world. And um, before I wrap up, I'm just going to read a quote from J.C. Ryle here, um, his thoughts on prayer. And if you ever get a chance, he has a little booklet on prayer. You can go on and Google it, and it's free online. It's a really good read, but uh, here's one of the opening quotes. Just at a as it is with the mind and body, so it is with the soul. There are certain things absolutely needful to the soul's health and well-being. Each must attend to these things for himself. Each must repent for himself. Each must apply to Christ for himself. And for himself, each must speak to God and pray. You must do it for yourself, for by nobody else can it be done. To be prayerless is to be without God, without Christ, without grace, without hope, and without heaven. Is it to be on the, it is to be on the road to hell. Now, can you wonder why I asked the question, do you pray? So let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, the Bible. We thank you for the endless opportunities you've given us to pray and to honor you and to praise you and uh, we pray for those opportunities in our daily lives to pray for all the people we come across the people who are dear to us and the people who are not so dear lord that uh, we will see you working in the world through our prayers and we will continue to glorify you and uh, help us not to get bogged down in the culture and uh the world's views on prayer and on you, Lord, that uh, we will take you at your word. We will um, not make you a liar, that we will consider everything written here truth. And I pray that you'll once again, just let us to let us take the text, apply it to our lives and bring it out into a world desperately in need of you, because that makes you happy, Lord. And uh, we thank you for opportunities to do that. In your name we pray. Amen.